Let's start with something completely random, um, which I like to do to get everybody on the same page. Okay. So this is you. Okay. This is your immediate universe. Let's say this is your family. Okay. This is, let's say, are all of you from Mumbai, basically? M Mumbai and the suburbs? Right? Every, let's, let's say this is Mumbai. This is your family. This is you. This, what should we call this? this let's call this um, India. And let's call this the rest of the world. Okay? So what's happening? Just tell me what's happening from the world to India to whatever. Whatever is what's happening today in the world. Everything affects you. That is the story. Everything affects you. I'll show you how. What's happening in the world? Trade war. Should we put that here? US China trade war. And are you in finance? You said no, you're in manufacturing. Yeah, okay. Who else? Kerala floods. Kerala floods. India? India. Kerala floods. Okay. Rupee depreciating. Hmm? Rupee depreciating. Rupee depreciating. Should we put that in India? No. Or, or the world? Or, yeah, or, or the world, yeah? Anything else? Technological advancements, automation. Automation. Where should we put it? India, world? World. Yeah, it's across, right? Technology advancement. Okay. What else? Anything else? How, what's happening in India? Let's put a little bit more things in India. What's happening in India? Lots of things are happening, you know? Like in you know, the. Ele elections are coming up. Elec elections are coming up, right? I mean, in Asian games, we're doing really well, right? Athletics, we're doing really well. How many of you are into sports? Like, do like, not even like not sports, like not Asian games, but you know, you wouldn't be here. You'd be in uh, Malaysia or wherever that is. Uh, how many of you like to exercise or anything? You, all of you like to exercise. How many of you know that if you exercise, all your other problems will be solved? How many of you know that? Everybody knows that, right? So if you exercise, every single, this is, I'm, so, I'm sounding like Shri Shri Ravi Shankar or something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not, I don't even claim to be. But if you exercise, I'm not going to do the yoga next thing I'm going to do. So I can barely bend my stomach. Um, but really, when I give advice to people who come to me and talk to me and say, what, what should I do, right? If you can't think about anything, no, exercise. If you can't think about anything, exercise. Because nothing negative will come out of it, only positive will come out of it. So whether it is yoga, whether it's going for a walk, whether it is, you know, whatever, just lift weights or do whatever, right? That is one thing I have found myself always in a situation where when I feel depressed, when I, when I don't know what to do, I just go and do some exercise. And, and many of you may not have the liberty of going and doing exercises because of your responsibilities of family and the air and war. You, you don't have the option, right? But there's no such thing that there's no such thing like that. So in your world, you must exercise. I feel like that's one thing that is independent of everything that you do. Look for a job. You, and, and what I'm telling you is not rocket science, right? I'm just telling you what is real. What's happening in your family? If you, I don't want you to get personal, but what's happening in your, in your, in your part of the world where you, are, you have to come here to find a job? What's, like, are you stressed out? We all impact each other's state of mind. So one, in, one person is stressed out. That's very nice. That's very good, that's very good. Because your stress is affecting somebody else's or somebody else's stress is affecting you. So your impact of the other stress, that's a very, very good point, very good point. Okay, that's good. What else is stressing you out? Financial independence. Hmm? Financial independence. Financial independence, yeah, speak a little bit more about that. The, not, the inability to do what? You know, what? I mean, you can't, what do you want to do with the money? If, if, if somebody gave you a lot of money, what would you do? You can think a lot of other things. You know, you I think like you are kind of uh, helping your husband also, like yeah. you're not pressurizing him, you know, for a lot of things. Uh -huh. The kid is growing and also maybe like kind of support. I see, I see. Support. Okay, okay, okay. So just a family support, if there's a two-income family, then it just becomes a little bit more comfortable than a one-income family, it for example. It gives you confidence. Yeah. And you can, you know, you are, you are financially independent. Uh, maybe come as a you. tomorrow. Uh -huh. So you're capable enough to take care of yourself or the family. Okay. Or, you know, in any case. Okay, okay. Good, good. 
Yeah, no, these are very good points. So, you know, one of the things that I, I, I usually do this session, this topic for more than an hour, just this topic I do for more than an hour, but because I want to cover a lot of different topics, I just want to give you methodologies of how to do things. That is what I will do in the next hour or so, okay? So, but you understand what I'm trying to do? Uh, we, we all do this in our head, right? Take a notebook and draw this circle for yourself and figure out what are the things in this circle that impact you. And what, at least the awareness of what is impacting you should be, you should know. I mean, it is impacting you whether you like it or not. You're not thinking about it. Once you write it down, then the fact that Kerala floods is somehow affecting you, it is affecting you, somehow, right? But you don't know how. If you put a little bit of thought into how, there may be, there may be some friend over there in Kerala who you subconsciously think, you know, you don't know whether that person is doing well or not. You're not even calling that person, but in the, in your, your mind has already started thinking about that person. You don't know that, right? Can you hear something? What can you hear in the room? The AC. The AC. The AC. There are some noises. Yeah. See, until I told you to listen to the AC, you didn't know that the, you, your, your mind knew that the AC was there, but now you can hear it very loudly. Just because I pointed it out, right? Similarly, when you think about something, it becomes like the AC. You suddenly start listening to it, and you will do something about it. Okay, I'm really sounding like Sri Ravi Shankar now. I'm going to stop and take another topic. So let me, let me start with something completely... Oh, my God. This is terrible. Can someone just tell uh, the, the people to say that the eraser doesn't work? Uh -huh. Okay. Um, so my background. Ask me anything about... Ask me any question. And I can, I can ramble my CV to you and tell you what I've done. On the other hand, you can ask me questions and I'll try to answer them. So the way I do this exercise, this is, a, this is one topic. Circle of life, that is one topic. The second is uh, asking questions. And I'm going to show you a methodology to ask questions. A methodology. So ask me any question. So, I mean, initially in your introduction, you told that you are from research and development. Yes, yes. You know, I mean, how did you get into this? How, how did I get into research, right? So, kya hua? when I was finished my PhD from Jinjunwala College, who's from Ghatkopar? Nobody. Okay, so you know Ghatkopar, right? The Ghatkopar, the Jinjunwala College is there. This is 1980s. Uh, early 1980s, and uh, I was doing my master's, and I, after finishing my master's, I got my, uh, I did my B.Sc. in zoology, then uh, master's in also zoology, zoology with animal physiology as a background, and then uh, after zoology, yeah. No, no, pen writes, but I was well, eraser. Okay. okay. Uh, I was wondering by mistake if you got to have to use the permanent marker. Oh, marker. okay, okay. So uh, I went to college, and then I, um, to very, make a very long story short, uh, I went to give my interview in Tata Hospital to get my, to do my PhD, and it's a very competitive uh, environment to get a PhD, to, to do PhD in Tata Hospital. Uh, it's an it's a, it's a India-wide search, and then they choose five students for doing their PhD every year. And so uh, when I was doing my PhD, my father had known somebody, 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 and I had got a job in that time, a company called Hext. Hext used to be what today is Novartis. Right, that time I had got a, a job, already got a job, and you know, so when I went to, uh, I, I had no intention. I was not very studious, so I was not uh, in the in the frame of mind to do my PhD at that point. So I said, "Chalo, yaar, ja ke dekh lete hain." So I went with my friend. Picture jara tha main. Hum log picture jaane ke liye the. So Parel se we went there, and I had literally worn rubber chappal and gone, and like this, I went for the interview, and I sat in the interview, and in front of me, in in one small conference room, much smaller than this, 20 people. People were sitting like this around me, and I was sitting over there, right? And they asked me this question. They started asking me this question. In my college, I'd done pretty okay, so I knew all the answers of the, of the subject matter expe expectations that they are asking me. Then they started asking me about cancer. Can this is 1980s. Cancer me kya ho raha hai? Ye sab ho raha So I said, then my friend was waiting for me. Picture ka time ho raha tha. So then I actually literally said. Um, 
probably just subconsciously or whatever, that um, if I needed to know, if I knew everything about cancer, why would I come here? So I just, you know, because this Bindas attitude that I had, which is, I, I've got a job, I mean, laga uh, hua job, and I'm, my friend is waiting for, a, for, for go, going to watch a movie, I just want to finish the interview and go, right? And I got selected. And later on, my professor said that that is the answer that we want, were looking for. The honest answer is what we were looking for. Sometimes what happens is, when you go to interviews, that three idiots movie, it is like, it is, sometimes you feel like Bollywood, but that has so much meaning. No? Sometimes you feel like, um, if you just lay away your inhibitions, things happen, right? So um, that's how I got into my PhD. And then similar things happen in my career, and I, next thing I know, I'm, I'm in the United States. I'm, I'm doing my postdoctoral fellowship on HIV research in 1980s in uh, Cornell University Medical College. Then I got a chance to teach in University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. After that, I worked for Merck in vaccines for 10 years. After that, I went for Amgen, which is you know, the world's largest biotechnology company, for another 10 years. And 30 years later, I came back, and I worked with Kiran Mizunda Shaw here. I worked with her directly. Um, and uh, you know we're shaping the um, shaping the com the company to become a 10 billion dollar company. It's it's a, it's an amazing opportunity to do something like this. Right? So that's sort of the very very brief background of things. So ask me any other question. Okay, it it becomes difficult and abstract if I say ask me any question because you don't know what question to ask, right? So how do you ask questions? So in and you know that if you ask questions. Your, your life can change. You ask, like if I was Amitabh Bachchan today, what question do you ask me? I'm Amitabh Bachchan. Okay. Yeah, Amitabh Bachchan standing in front of you. You can ask any question you want. Can I take a selfie? I love it. Who would you like to come and sit across the chair on Please, come here. Come here, sit here with us. Sit here with us. So, uh, again, I, don't, I won't do that act for a long time because I think I want to get to the point of how to ask questions. So in the continuum of data, we have a lot of data, right? And you know the world today is all about data. The largest companies in the world have become large not because they manufacture something, whether it's Facebook, whether it's Google, Amazon, you know, all these big companies, yeah, $150 billion companies are uh, Apple. Apple is a trillion dollar company is all about data, right? Data is converted to information, OK? Information becomes knowledge, right? And knowledge becomes? What does knowledge become? Wisdom. Wisdom, very good, right? How does data become knowledge? How does data become information? And you start providing it? Yeah, analyzing the data. When you start analyzing the data, I'm just writing abbreviation, analyzing the data, the data becomes information, correct? You have a large piece of data, the data is organized in some way, and um, uh, we, go, we, 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 we take information, right? Well, that becomes information. Um, okay, let's see, how that, let's see how that happens. What's your name? Rachna. Rachna. Rachna, can you take me to Oberoi for dinner tonight? Yeah, sure. No, uh, you don't. The answer is not. You shouldn't say yes. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <a> <laughs> I would love to. You would love to. You no, no. So I'm, I'm trying to get to the point of how do you take data, right? Normally you would say no, okay. right? Normally you'd say. So uh, you will say like, oh no, no, no. I can't take you out for dinner. First of all, I don't know who, who are you. You must, you know. I'll, but the, but the reality is that in order for you to take me out to dinner, what data do you need? Your timing, I mean your time uh, I'm just speaking from a financial perspective. Can you financially afford to take me out to dinner? Mm -hmm. Right? So how, what data do you need? The uh, cost of dinner. Cost of dinner. So the, for example, how much do you spend, for example, and you don't have to get personal, you can just give me a ballpark. How much do you spend in a month eating out? Approximately. Mm -hmm. 3,000 rupees. 3,000 yeah. rupees approximately. Right? Let's say. And sometimes you spend more. How much? 3,000 to? 7,000. 7, 7, maybe 10,000? Maybe 10,000 a month you would, you would spend? Right? How much would it cost to go to the Oberoi for dinner? Around 
5,000. Let's say, let's say 5,000 each, by the way. Yeah. So yeah. 5,000 each. You will also eat, right? Yes. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's say it costs you 10,000 rupees for going out to dinner. Now, if I now convert this, this is per month, right? So this will be 36,000 per year, right? And this is 1,20,000 per year. That's what, you, that, that's what you spend for going out to dinner. Right? Every year, through the year. 10,000 rupees looks like a lot of money for one dinner when, it's, when you have this piece of data. When this piece of data appears, now it doesn't seem that daunting. Married by the fact that you're going out to a dinner with some significant person who has the ability to change your career. Right? I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, you know, when you make these decisions with data analysis, this is how you manage data. Every situation in your life, there is data. We have to look for that data. What is that relevant data that is important for us? Right? And we talk about specifically from a job perspective in a minute, what kind of data should you be looking for? We'll come back to that. But do you sort of agree with that you took a lot of data, analyzed it systematically, now you're able, you have information now, right? And with that information, you are now able to make a decision. And we'll get to decision making in a minute. So then how is information converted to knowledge? What do you have to do? What happens to the, what happens to information that it becomes knowledge? You have, to, you have to understand, the, yeah, you have to understand, you have to process, right? You have to understand the, the, the information, process the information. Uh, define knowledge. What is the definition of knowledge in an English language? You can ramble a little bit. It is. Collection, something uh, collection, relevant collection, information. Uh, collection, uh, collection of relevant information. Okay, very, very good, very good. Collection of relevant information, correct, is knowledge, right? Then what is wisdom? How to apply. apply. How to apply, correct, correct. Now knowledge becomes, right? Can a three-year-old baby be wise? Yes. yes. Yeah, wise? Yes. Wise? No. Wise. no. Yes. Yeah. Sometimes they're more smarter than us. <laughs> they don't think. Yeah. 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 I mean, there are differences of opinion. I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, there is no right answer in this process. It's, it's, uh, what I'm trying to tell you is, in every topic that I will talk about, it is about reflecting. How do you reflect? I'm trying to get to you, how do, how do you reflect on this concept, right? So when you reflect on this concept and you hit, the, you, you hit the nail on the head. So what happens in data, you have a lot of pieces of data, right? You analyze it and it becomes information, correct? It some sort of becomes like a piece of information. And as you correctly pointed out, lots of different pieces of information becomes knowledge. And what is wisdom? Lots of different, hold on to your seats, Lots of different types of information is wisdom. Now, how is that correct? It is orthogonal data. This is the same data being processed. You took the information from me. You took uh, the fact that you know it costs so much to go to uh, Oberoi, and in the year, this is all data you process in information, right? You still, this is just information. Now you need to make a decision. Now orthogonal data will be, who am I going to dinner with? Is that person going to impact my life? Is it worth it for me to spend 10,000 rupees to, to be, then you'll get wise. And then you will make a decision, Executive. right? So from a process perspective, this for me has been very useful to understand how data is converted to information, information is converted to knowledge, and knowledge is converted to wisdom. We all want to be wise, right? But how do you get wise? You get wise through taking one piece of information and then applying it somewhere here. You said correctly, applying it. But what does that mean? It means you need like three, four pieces of data Analyze it in a different way, and that becomes wisdom. So I'm, it's very abstract right now. It's, I mean, I gave you the example of, the, of taking out to dinner, but that's, that's a different decision, right? But you can, you can take this and think about it. So it started this exercise to ask, to help you ask me questions. 
Now to go from data to information, what you have to do is generally you ask what, when, where kind of questions. What happened? Where did it happen? Um, wh when did it happen? Sorry? The five W's. Yeah, the five W's, right? The when did it happen? The, then you will, that data will then be converted to information. In general, information is converted to knowledge by asking the question, how? How did it happen? Right? That is generally the question. Yeah? And therefore, the last, how does this become wisdom? What question do you have to ask? Why? Why did it happen? Gets you wisdom. Right? So think about it. I've worn this shirt. I'm head of R&D in Biocon. I've worn this shirt. Right? It's totally unnatural for me to wear this shirt and come like this, no? To this uh, event where I want to recruit people and who, I've come with this really crazy Hawaiian kind of shirt. Right? This is not, doesn't look professional. Right? So you can ask me this question, uh, where did you buy this shirt? Interesting, this shirt is almost free, almost meaning I had to pay a ticket for it. Uh, when you go to see a football game or a basketball game or a baseball game in, in the US, they give you free shirts. This is Philadelphia Phillies, right? This is a free shirt that I got from them. I love it. It's, you know, it's really soft material for Bombay weather. It's perfect, right? Very comfortable, right? Um, so where did I get it? I got it in Philadelphia, free. That's, if you ask me this question, where did you get it? It's still actually a pretty interesting answer. How did you get it? I went with my daughter and her partner, and then I went her, I went, we went to the football, uh, to the basketball game, and when we entered, you know, they gave us this shirt, and that's how I got this shirt. That's how I got this shirt, right? If you ask me a question, why did you wear this shirt today? I'll have to give you a philosophical answer. I can't give you some stupid answer. And the answer is, I am a flamboyant personality. I, I love this flamboyance in myself, right? I portray this in Biocon every day. I have a band in my office. My office is about this big. And I have a full band in my office. The drum set and the djembe and the tabla and the harmonium and the keyboard, everything in my office. Anybody who comes into my office can come and sing a song. Literally. And I'm not just saying it for the sake of saying it. Because I know for a fact that that changes the mood of the meeting, that changes how things can get done, and I know that that is going to get done. It's all about human interactions, right? A lot of very, very famous people have come to my office. Shah Rukh Khan has come to my office, right? All, and because of my position, I, I'm, I have access to a lot of people, right? 20, 20 prime ministers from African countries came to my office. They played the djembe. One of the guys played fantastic djembe in my office, changed it, right? And, and they remember me forever. They, like, they will never forget that, you know, they came to somebody's office and that person, that person had a, like, a technical guy, but the guy had a band in his office. Like, how, when does that happen, right? So anyway, doing, I'm not saying doing unusual thing for the sake of doing unusual thing. You should know why you're doing what you're doing. Awareness is all what I'll constantly be telling you about. Okay, so you can write, if you're writing notes, the first part was circle of life. This is called how to ask questions. So ask me any question, any question. Can you think of any, generally if you ask me a question with why, it'll always be wise. Why did you what, something. Okay, let me tell you something. Uh, I have one daughter and one daughter-in-law. And, uh, but I have only one daughter. I don't have a son. But I have a daughter-in-law. No. Hmm? I, don't, I don't have a son. I have a daughter and a daughter-in-law. No, she's my daughter-in-law. But I have only one daughter. How can I? Huh? You can't say it. Think what you're thinking, but just say what you're thinking. Yeah, I mean, oh, she is. Uh, yes. Gay. But yes, she is lesbian. Yeah, she is lesbian, right? So, gay, right? You, it's very difficult for you to think about the answer. 
You know the answer, but you will not say it. Oh, what will he think? If she is not lesbian, then what will he say? Right? You can't think about this, no? So I keep asking this question. Because, you know, when you ask a question, the other, peop the other people are going to have the same question, but don't want to ask it. Right? Okay, keep thinking of questions. We'll go on to the next session. But keep thinking of questions. Make a list of any question you want. Nothing, nothing is out of bar. Because it is very rare for you to meet people who, have, who are in different parts of this. This, is, this has provided you an opportunity to meet people with different career backgrounds, right? Ask questions. OK. Let's move to a different topic. I mean, I call that inflection points. OK, this board is going to get pretty dirty. Um, all right. How many of you in, in high school or have done science? And, and, and others have done humanities or commerce or something, right? Commerce. But um, in school, you must have learned how to grow cells, no? How cells grow. If you put a cell in a Petri dish or a, or a flask, you know that it will grow, no? Right? So it will grow. If I draw this curve and I ask you the question, these are cells, and this is time. And if the cells are growing like this, they, go, they grow like this. They, they grow in what is called a sigmoid curve, an S-shaped curve. And why is it sigmoid? Because there are these points called the inflection points. You, in any curve, the point at which the shape of the curve changes is called an inflection point. OK? I mean, it's, it's an English language. It's, it's nothing to do with statistics or mathematics or anything. OK? That's the shape of the curve. The other option for the cells to grow is to grow linear, right? Straight line. Generally, what happens in chemical reactions, if you take chemical A and you mix it with chemical B, right, you will always get chemical C. It's very unlikely that you, unless you put a catalyst to some different phenomena. But if you take chemical A and put chemical B, it will always give you chemical C. Biological systems, what happens? If you take a biological substance A and you put a biological substance B, you will get anything from C to Z. Doesn't matter. What, it could be anything. In this, any biological system, you look at your own growth. When you were a baby, you grow slightly, you know, one or two, four, for your kids also, one or two, three, four years, they grow, you know, slowly. Suddenly, they'll be like this spurt. This spurt happens, right? This is biology. This, all biological systems always grow exponentially, always. There's no exception, right? So when cells grow, you can imagine what those cells are, right? You, you understand what cells are? They are, they are put in them, you put them in some, a flask, and you put some media, and they are growing. Correct? Why are they growing exponentially? Why not just linear? What's happening in that cell culture that is making them grow in an exponential state? I'll put some points, and then you can add more. First of all, this is cell number, right? There are few cells, correct? And so there's no competition. Very few cells, no competition. Correct? What else is there in this culture? I'm adding media. And there are very few cells. And they're growing exponentially. They want, they want to grow exponentially. What else is happening in this culture media? Is the right environment is there. Right? What is the environment in the cell culture? It is the uh, amino acids, the... Um, pH, the temperature, the, the, uh, all, the, all the nutrient components of the, of the media which is allowing the cells to grow are all very, very healthy. Right? They're very healthy. The cells are young, so to speak. Right? So they are anxious to grow. So they're growing. Right? They are secreting what is called growth factors. They secrete things which allow other cells to grow. Right? All of these things are happening, and suddenly, instead of growing linear, they grow exponential. Right? When they come to the top of the curve, now what's happening? Why are they stopped? Why did this? Exactly opposite of what is happening here, no? Now lots of cells are there. High competition for the same amount of environmental factors, 
Environmental factors have not changed. They are the same, same oxygen, same, lots of oxygen was here, there's no oxygen anymore, right? Lots of carbon dioxide, the environmental factors have gone down. Now instead of secreting growth factors, now they are secreting toxins. They're killing each other, right? And the cells are dying. Now in order for them to grow again, you have to take out those cells and put them back into some fresh media and then they start growing again exponentially, right? But at this time, they're all dead. They're dying. If you don't do anything, these all die, right? So in this workshop, the dramatic thing I do at this point is I cancel this and I write your career. It's exactly the same. Exactly the same. No difference. And I'm going to walk you through this process. And this I, I'll call inflection points. Sorry, the mic keeps falling off. Sorry about that. Please, I heard you me talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can continue with your... Yeah, so, so what I'm going to write over here, don't erase everything. Yeah. Just erase, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. erase everything, erase everything. So what are the factors in your career that will allow you to grow exponentially? What are the things that you have to do? I'll write, I'll write some of those things down. Okay. I'm going to say some are in your control, some are not in your control. So what's in your control? What can you do? Building self. Building self-confidence. Everything. Building self. Oh. Okay, building self. Everything. Okay, knowledge. Uh, yeah. All of those factors. What else? Developing can... skills. Hmm? Developing skills. Skills. What kind of skills? Learning new skills. New skills. Um, yeah. Uh, enhancing old ones. Yeah. Making new skills. Yeah. What else? Exploring options. Options. Uh, yeah. Exploring. Yeah. Very good. Yeah? What else? Priorities. Priority. Very good, very good. What else? Networking. Hmm? Networking. Networking, yes, very good. This is part of your exercise of your actually taking some action on these things, coping right? Up with the existing work culture. Yes, Co yeah, yeah, yeah. Coping, coping with all the, not just coping with culture of both work and home. All, I'm sure all of you have your home cultures to be. Pani milsek pa? What else? What is not in your control that is absolutely critical for you to grow? The support at home. Support. So, should I put family? For example? Uncertainties. Yeah, okay. What, is, uh, what else is not in your. Is your environment in your control? Environment is not. Is, really? Is your environment not in your control? Okay, we'll put it in not in your control. What else is not in your control? Like opportunities. Yeah. Okay, I like the word opportunity. I really like it because I'm going to put it on the, excuse my spelling, but um, I'm going to put it in the not in your control. But do you really, can, can you, can it be in your control? The opportunity itself is not in your control, but getting yourself ready for that opportunity is in your control. Do you agree? And what that you have, what you have to do to get ready for that opportunity is in your checklist. I'm just showing you the process of what needs to be written in, your, in that, in your control, not in your control. How about mentor? Does everybody have a mentor? No. Why? Why you don't have a mentor? You know about mentor, no? Why you don't have a mentor? I'm just, I'm being, by the way, I'm just being very uh, direct because, you know, uh, we, we don't think about, like one of the things that I talk about my own career is that I wish I had a mentor. I, it never occurred to me that I needed a mentor. And we have a lot of mentors. We have families are our mentor, our parents are our mentors. But really somebody, hmm? Husband. <laughs> yeah, sometimes families are, you know, it's, it's, it becomes dicey whether they are mentors or not. <laughs> like the situation bit depend karta hai. But you know, you know what a mentor is, right? Your mentor is someone who really cares about you without any judgment. That is what a mentor is. And you know who those people are in your lives, right? You can freely go and tell them what is going on in your mind. Free your mind, free your mind of everything, right? And so this, you have these people in your lives. Spend time to talk to them. They will change your life. They'll give you ideas. And mentors are generally not people who will give you advice or anything. Don't look for advice from mentors. They're essentially a mirror. They're listening to you. All they do is to listen to you. And when you talk, stuff will happen. 
that's 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 what a mentor does. So two weeks ago, uh, my uh, high school friend, uh, who had a who had a crush on at that time in high school, many many years ago, is the dean of AFMC now. She's the first woman dean of AFMC ever in the history of AFMC. You can give her a hand. Major General Madhuri Kanitkar. Just look her up. Right? Amazing woman. Amazing woman. She's a dean of AFMC. You, everybody knows AFMC, right? Armed Forces Medical College in Pune. Right? She's a dean of that place. So she called me and said, can you come and talk to us about whatever? So I, I do a course on drug development. And if you guys are interested, I, I do this exercise on how to make medicines in 15 minutes. You will make the medicine. I'll, I'll try, I'll try, we'll attempt that. We'll see how that works. So I went and did the same exercise with the third year medical students from AFMC, in AFMC itself, right? Just a, a group of about 100, 100 students. I need to put that in perspective of who these 100 students are. Um, AFMC selects 150 students every year, hmm? of which 25 are women, not 50-50. 25 women, 125 men. I asked this question to Madhuri herself. Right? She said, you know, we need men in the front. That these doctors have to go straight to Kargil. Their first appointment is directly on the border only. So women, are, the army is not ready to take women to that, that level yet. She herself is trying to change things. The first, uh, first woman uh, dean in 60 years of existence of AFMC. So, you know, think about women empowerment. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. I'm very passionate about women empowerment. My daughter influences me enormously about women empowerment. I'll talk to, I'll talk to you about her. So when I did this thing, exact thing that I'm doing, I drew, a, I drew a graph, I drew cell culture, I said, what are the factors that make cells grow? They said the same things that you said, and they, and they said the same thing, that, and I thought, oh, well, they'll say the same things here. They said something completely different, completely different from what you said. They said, honor the order is the exponent. Why? What will change your lives? Honor the order. Courage, respect, integrity, trust. They're like 10 things, like this. None of this. No skills will, nothing, nothing, nothing. That's what they said, these students. Amazing. I like, Mary wrong take ho Right? But none of those things, what you said, what, what they said, doesn't apply to you. It applies to all of us. Courage you need. You need courage. Have you, have you heard of this 11 second thing? Story about 11 seconds. You heard about this? No. Supposedly there's this, it could be a fact, it could be a myth, but you can take it the way you like it. Um, if you do 11th, if you do something, whatever it is, if you do something that takes 11 seconds of unsurmountable courage for you to do, right? If you do that in 11 seconds, your life will change. Give me an example of that. The easiest one is, you know, the boy proposes to the girl. Life changed. It takes 11 seconds of that incredible courage, right? I know this is a morbid uh, <laughs> example. I can't think of anything else. The suicide person who's going to jump <laughs> takes 11 seconds to decide whether to jump or not. I know it's morbid, <laughs> but 11 seconds. Do anything for 11 seconds of extraordinary courage, and your life will change. I, I believe in that. When I had to make a decision, of whether to come to India after 30 years of living in the US, never having stayed in India, right? I needed that 11 seconds of courage to make that decision, right? It wasn't exactly 11 seconds, but you know, the, 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 the analogy is I, I needed that enormous amount of courage to be able to say, the, to take that courage, because I, I took a huge pick up to come here, huge, right? But I feel very passionate about the possibilities of what can be done in India. I just feel very passionate about it. That's why I'm here to talk to all of you. So we'll stop here uh, for this section. And then now I'm going to ask this question of ask me any question. It's like, you know, what prompted me to get back? 
So, you know, obviously family is the one big thing. So I got, we got divorced, my wife and I got divorced about four or five years ago. And, with, and we have a very good relationship right now. She's from Pune, she's from Bombay, from uh, Shivaji Park. And she and I drifted apart over the years and we separated. And so we have, we have a very good relationship now. Right, and it's, I know it's a weird thing to say, but um, we do. <laughs> and um, uh, she's doing very well. She she works for a large multinational company out of Dallas, and um, we meet very often. Um, and we have one daughter. You know, it's our lives are our lives are like most of you <laughs> are around our kids. So you know, and my daughter's all settled in Philadelphia. They have a, they live in a house there. Um, and so when, when, when the time comes to think about what you want to do in the last decade of your career, um, you want to do something impactful. You just don't want to you know, ride into the sunset, <laughs> so to speak. You want to do something dramatic or something impactful. Because after having so much experience in, um, in drug development, in such big companies and such big uh, uh, organizations, um, you feel like, I felt like um, there's something to give back. And, and it's, it's, it sounds egotistic, and it is egotistic. I mean, that ego is there in your head. I can't escape it, right? It is there, but I, but I accept it. I accept that I have an ego, and I don't try to shy away from it. Hey, now, I'm, how to deal with it, I, I'm trying to deal with it, but that, that's a whole different story. But what has happened is extraordinary, right? Um, I told you that being head of R&D in a company like Biocon, which is the India's largest biotechnology company, right, is something that I could not have imagined the magnitude of this thing. It's huge. It's massive. Not the company itself, like the, the role is huge. The, the director general of uh, the DCGI office, um, which is the um, office that makes the government rules, right, uh, invites me to their meetings to make the laws of the land of how to develop drugs, right? So I'm participating in those conversations. I'm part of the prime minister's office to help in the scientific advice to the prime minister. Not directly, but in the committee. Not my, as an individual, but part of the committee. I would have never had this opportunity in the US, no? Never. And I couldn't have said, okay, I will do that here. Nothing, that doesn't happen, right? My sister is four years older than me. By the way, my sister is from Armed Forces Medical College. And so um, she is, because she was in four years older than me, uh, she was always out of the house. So when we were in high school, she was already in college. And uh, we, meaning my sister, younger sisters and me, um, she was already out of the college. Uh, she was already in college. And by the time we went to college, she was posted and she was never with us. She was always out. And for the last 30 years, when I, when I was in the US, whenever I came back, like many of you may have family from the US, right? And when they come, they come for two days to your house, right? Uh, and most of the time, I spend with my parents. When my sister, who lives in Bangalore, I visited them for two days. <laughs> a year for 30 years, for example, right? Here, I'm staying with her. I'm staying in her house for three years. The relationship I've got with my sister, I could not have imagined how beautiful it is. First time in 50 years, I'm having a relationship with my sister. This I could not have put in a checklist and said, these are the advantages of coming back to India. Could not have done that. So, so many things have happened. I can, I can go on forever about like how, why it is so, and I tell all my friends in the US, when you finish all your responsibilities of your kids growing up, please come back. There's so much to do. There's so much to do. And I feel like that's one thing I'm doing a lot. Okay, let's move on to a different topic. The eraser, okay. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, so actually, uh, any questions that come up? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah, no, no, I think it's a very, very well put point. And, and I'm so happy you brought it up because. Uh, you, OK, thank you. Thank you for coming. And um, if the, my email address is somewhere. Actually, if you don't have it, it's just. It's just my last name, Chirmule. 
at gmail.com. No suffix, no prefix. Okay. Yeah? You're very welcome. C-H-I-R, it's in the brochure, the last, uh, it's the last, my last name at gmail.com. Actually, at, at gmail.com, at yahoo.com, at icloud.com, at everything, I've got all the domains. My, my family is like pissed off at me. Everybody has to put A, one, two, three, I've got only chirmule at everything.com. <laughs> okay, um, so very good question. Let's, let's move to a section which I call decision making, which I think will help you a little bit in terms of getting to how to make decisions. So let's make a decision. In the next five minutes, let's make a decision. Let's make a decision on anything you want. What should we make a decision on in five minutes? What, what, what's, what's, your, what's your name? Alameen. Hmm? Alameen. Oh, very nice name. Oh, you know, oh, very nice name, yeah. OK, uh, what, what, were you thinking about like a decision? That you, you mentioned something about decision, that's why. Yeah, like a lot of times, you know, when you're thinking of like, should I put my dog or you know, start coming? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's let's say let's put start a company. So you want to make a decision of whether you want to start a company, okay? Give me three more decisions that we could take. What 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 other decision could you take? Change uh, your uh, line of work. Line of work. Li change line of work. Okay. What else? Uh, go go back to college. Uh, go back to college. Give me one more. Anything. Give me something very, very different. It can be hypothetical also. OK, I'll give you one, right? Let's paint this room pink. This room will paint it pink. We'll make a decision of painting it pink. Since it's my game, like this is the game, right? This is a, of decision making. I made the decision of making a decision on painting the room pink. I made the decision. And it's final. OK? So now we're going to decide to paint the room pink. OK? Please decide. No, no, the decision to choose what decision to make, I made. The decision of whether to paint and drink or whatever is your decision. Please make the decision. Pink. Um, yeah, you tell me. Should be in the room pink. No. How about you? No. No. Anyone else wants to make a decision? Who makes the decision? Who who is responsible for making this decision? Who is the owner? Huh? No, no, no. The painting this room pink. Who is responsible for making this room deciding whether to paint this room pink or not? Yeah, no. You and I can't decide. Yeah. Who is this person who is who will decide whether to paint it pink or not? The now, who is the authority? Somebody. There must be somebody. Who is this person? What's your name? Sindhi. Sindhi. Oh, Sindhi. Sorry, sorry. Sindhi. 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 Yeah. So Sindhi. Let's say you are the facilities manager of this building. Okay? Is that the facilities manager will make the decision? No. You are the facilities manager of this building, and you will make the decision of whether to paint this room pink or not. Okay? Okay, first of all, what is the question on which we're making the decision? Whether to paint the room pink or Can you form it in a sentence for me? Can you form a sentence? You said the right thing, yes or no. The question should have the, un the answer to that question that Siddhi is going to answer should be only yes or no. She should only have those two choices. We need to change the color of the room. Should we paint the room pink? Okay, what's your name? Ashika. Ashika. Okay. Ashika, please ask Siddhi the question. Should we paint the room pink? And, no. uh, wait, wait, wait. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, before you answer the question, I'm going to tell you a few things. This process of decision making, and we'll get to your question, original question in a minute. It's called the DAI process of decision making. It's a very famous process, and um, people have all 
corporate organizations do this training through McKinsey and all people come and train you. But I'm giving you a glimpse of what that decision making process is and you can apply it to any decision that you want to make. So in the D, which is the decision making process, the question on which you're going to make the decision on has to be very, very precise. And for the most part, the answer should be yes or no. Okay? The quality of that question is very important. Think about that. If the quality of the question is not good, then the quality of the decision will also not be good. So the quality of the question is good. How do you define the quality of the question? That it should have a? It should be only yes or no. It should no maybe, thus, therefore, if, but, light pink, dark pink, nothing like that. Yes or no, right? The decider should be pre-decided. Think about it. The decider, you many times in the decision-making process, you don't know who the decider is. I've done an exercise like this of, with, with a group of young college students. Hmm? Uh, and and they, they came up with, I've done this exercise on painting the room pink so many times, so I, I, I know exactly what, what's going to happen. Uh, they said, let's, get, let's, let's, let's decide whether we get married or not. Right? And then we, uh, and this is the first time I did something like that. When I went through the process and I said, make the decision on whether you go, oh, I don't make the decision, my parents make the decision. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, the decider is to be pre decided. So, we pre decided the decider based on logic, not some random thing. We think that the um, person who makes the decision of whether to paint this room pink or not should be the facilities manager. And we've assigned Siddhi that accountability and responsibility to ensure that she will make the decision, okay? Now, as a decision maker, right, it is your responsibility to get advice. Before you make the decision, that's why I stopped you, right? Before you make the decision, now take off that hat of, decision, of the decision maker and now get advice. All of you, now you can give her advice whether to paint it pink or not. Now you can go and talk to everybody and get advice. You have, you don't have unlimited time, so. <laughs> So give her advice now. Maybe you like it. <laughs> no. no Any suggestions? The painting is really required or not? Also, you have a theme and a reason why. Yeah. Do you have any advice to give her? Is it really? Huh? You, she has amazing advice, but she'll not give it to you. She won't give it to you. It is your responsibility to get the advice from her. She will not give it to you. How will you get advice from her? She has amazing advice. But she will not give it to you. As a deciding responsibility, it is your responsibility to get as much orthogonal advice as possible. I, you, I'm using the word orthogonal a lot, I see, right? Disconforming at want. If everybody says no, you have to think about what will happen if it is yes. You have to, uh, in the advice making and decision making process, you're, you're not making a decision, you're analyzing the advice. Right? Pros and cons and this and that, you're looking at everything with, with unbiased manner. Right? And then you make a decision. Now, let's say everybody's giving you advice. Right? Ask her the question. And the answer? Answer is drum roll. <laughs> answer is? No. No. Okay. Actually, I, I did a wrong thing. Just reverse back a little bit, but it will not be as much fun as it is now, uh, but you will understand why I'm doing it. So, normally what I'll do, I'll come very close to her and ask her to whisper the decision to me. You will say no, right? And I will say, did you hear the decision? You couldn't hear the decision because you whispered it to me. How many times does that happen? The decider is pre-decided. The question is of very high quality. The advice has been obtained. The decision is made. You don't know what the decision is. Not informed. You didn't tell anyone what the decision was. Right? I is for informed. Right? That's the DA. And every decision works like that. Somebody asked me this question, but I make decisions in split seconds. Right? Even in a split second, that's, everything happens. The decider's pre-decided, the question is there, the advice has been obtained, and informed. It's you only. You're the advisor, you're the informed, you're everything. Right? And you make the decision. Okay. I'm the head of Breast Cancer Institute, 
And I come into this gallery and I come and say, hey, you know what? Only if this room was pink, I would have given all these women in this room a vice president job in my company. <laughs> right? Was your decision good? No. Terrible decision. <laughs> right? By definition, a decision is 50% wrong. Doesn't have the element of time. Doesn't have the element of time. So every decision is 50% wrong. I know it's provocative. But it is 50% wrong. So don't get paralyzed in making decisions. It is 50% wrong. Mom. Guaranteed wrong. I want to marry this boy, 50% wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you won't know <laughs> till later, right? I want to have kids, 50% wrong. Not 50, but <laughs> you see what I'm saying, right? Now, if you go back to your decision that you want to make in your lives, whatever it is, right, and apply this process of decision making, it becomes a little bit easier in the head. Because you go through this process by understanding the decision maker, the accountability, you know who the, sometimes the decision is not yours to take. You have to enforce the decision maker to make the decision. It's not easy to make decisions, very difficult to make decisions. I make decisions, or my whole job is about decision making only. I decide whether we have to buy a 3,000 crore company. Yes or no? I have to get advice, and Kiran will say, you're head of R&D, you make the decision. I have to make it, there's no choice. And it's 50% wrong, no? I make the decision, and until we buy the company and then you know, do something with it, and then later on we'll only find out that it is wrong. Or later on only we'll find out that it is right, 50% wrong. I will get as much advice and remove the, the uncertainty of being wrong as much as I can, but never zero, no? Never zero. Okay, I'll stop here because this is the part of the, of the session that goes through decision making. Usually what I do is I ask people like, what decisions have you made in your life? And then we can sort of debate that, but we don't have time. So, but you reflect upon it yourself. Okay. All right, so any other thoughts or questions? How much time do we have, sir? It's 4.37. Do we, is everybody okay with another 20 minutes or so? We can do another exercise. How do you accept your oneself yeah, after making a wrong decision? Yeah. Um, first of all, you won't know. It's 50% correct and 50%. Percent wrong, correct. And actually moving on and moving more upwards, in the better, for the better. Yeah. I mean, I think if, if there was no, if there was no. Yeah. You eventually realize that at least 50% of your decision was wrong. Yeah. yeah. Or it could have been better. Yeah. If you had more information. Yeah. Right? But decision making is always at a finite time, right? And at the, the reason you have to make a decision is because you don't have all the data. Mm -hmm. If you had all the data to make the decision, you would have waited for that data and got the decision made correctly. But the reason you have to make a decision, right, is because the element of time is there. You can't wait forever to make decisions, no? You have to make some decision at some point. You have to decide, so whoever said, uh, go back to college, at some point you have to decide whether to go to college or not. How much are you going to procrastinate, right? You just, one day you just have to make a decision and 50% wrong. But actually 50% right also, no? So don't be afraid of making decisions. There will always be consequences of the decision. There's no question about it. And there will be wrong decisions that will be made, and you will have an opportunity to re-decide on something later on. The process will still be the same. So can you give a more realistic, uh, since this is like three elements that you mentioned, yeah. if I need to take a decision today, yeah. and I, do, I, I can, like for example, let's say my I have to decide whether, what, do I, what should I do? Should I get back to a career which uh, is more congruent with my uh, learning or my education, my degrees, or should I do something which is, uh, you know, it takes care of the fact that I'm a mother and I have children and this is something which I'm more current with. That's it, that's my decision today. Okay. Logic, sense, everybody tells me that there's more money here, it yeah. makes more sense. Yeah. Years down the line, the kids, we value you more. But this is something that I'm, so I am confused. You're confused. So what should I do? Yeah. And yeah. I add to her point, what you said is very valid and I think adding into it, I think specifically in India when we talk about 
it's not only me as a person or yeah, me as a person that I'm making a decision. For me, maybe sometimes I'm in a position to take a decision, but not I mean because we have to look uh, for what the what is suitable for the complete family or specifically maybe husband. So sometimes I want to make a decision, but my husband is not in a favor of you know that particular Working. decision. So I mean it's not only you know just to make it realistic when we say so many emotional factor also comes into the picture. So how do we handle that? And I think that becomes more important, you know, in in kind of you know, uh, making the decision that, yeah, yeah you know. Yeah, so what she says is right, but in my case, I think I have a supportive environment, but it's in my head. I don't know what to choose. Okay. Because I am, uh, you know, I have all the support. You can do what you want, you can go whatever time you want. But you know, deep down, I know what is practical and what is not. Okay. So, so um, Okay, so so I mean I, obviously I don't have the answer to that question, and, and I'm going to try to attempt to give you some answers based on my own experiences, um, and and I'll and since I have imbibed this process of decision making into myself, nas nas me basa, you know I've been doing this DAI process for decision making for 20 years. I've been trained on this by um, by corporate training, and I, I it's like uh, it's like I do this all the time, right? So for me, decision making is my job. Right, so it's, I, w I won't say it's easy, but I, I, it, it comes to me naturally because I know I can, I have this nirvana state because I know that oh, I'll take the decision, kuch ho gaya to ho gaya, right? And I appreciate you bringing your specific situation up. But let's take a hypothetical situation for you. For you. Let's say, for example, you might, wa you might be, wa you want to get specific or you, I, I'll be happy to help in some way. O on, a, on a process, I won't be able to help you with the decision, but I'll, I can help you with the process. So let's say you want to do three jobs. There are three options of jobs. Your family, you, you, according to you, your family support is there. So if you want to do it, do it. Or whatever, agar tum, if you're working from nine to five for that job, we will take care of whatever you are doing right now. That you don't have to worry about. You're in a fortunate position to be in that. Um, most people may not be in that situation, but you are, yeah. right? Now, you have three, th three potential things that you need to make a decision on. What is the question? What is, the, what is the question on which you want to make the decision? There are layers of questions. What is the first question? First question would be something like, should I work? Right? I'm making it as simple as possible. And the answer is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. so that's clear? Yeah. Now you can move to the next. But last year it wasn't. Ha, okay. But now, now, but last year. Today you want to work. Should I, should I work? And the answer is yes. Okay, most of you will probably, otherwise you won't be here, no, yeah. right? Should I work? Yes. Now, the, if you ask a question, what should I work on? It doesn't have a yes, no answer. So make a question which has a yes, no answer for yourself. Should I work in, let's what, what do you want to work in? M marketing. No, so either in the field of education or maybe consulting. Consulting, okay, let's take one. Should I work in education? Yes. Answer? Yes. yes. Already clarified, right? Now, what is the next question? What is education? Because I don't have the supporting. Uh, you don't have the education. I don't have. You don't. You don't have the education for education, <laughs> yeah. right? <laughs> no, no. I'm just. I'm not being. I'm not being satirical. I'm being practical. Teacher, right? Right. So then, the next. What What does your obvious next question become? What should I do to? No, it's not a good question. Not a good question. Yeah, anybody can help her. What should her next question be? Should I take up some course which can help she can explore? Is the answer yes or no? Answer not yes or no? The question has to be yes or no. Can I get additional qualification? Answer is? Yes. Yes. And you, the next question can't be, where can I get to education? Because that is not yes or no question. See, the, it, is, it is so boringly process that every time you make a question that has a yes or no answer, it will get you to a decision. It's a flow chart. It's a flow chart. It, and you have to discipline yourself to ask the question that it is a yes or no answer. Otherwise, you will get confused. Which course should I do? Ten answers. The confusion. Should I do mathematics? No. Clear. <laughs> right? So I think for me, that has helped a lot. 
in, in terms of getting to where you need. And it's not one decision, right? It's not one decision. It is as layers of decision. And you need to figure out. And sometimes for me personally, writing these down actually helps me. Actually physically write down the question, answer yes or no. In my mind, I've said, have I got the right advice? Have I talked to my mentor? Have I then, have I then after analyzing all the data, worn the decision making hat and intelligently made that yes, no decision? Or have I just made it frivolously, right? If you go through this process, I think it'll help. I mean, I'm, I don't guarantee that it'll help in every situation. There might be some such situation where it won't. For the, for the most part, it works. And then even, like, say, let's say for your, um, if your family is affected by the decision that you make, for example. No, no, I mean, no I'm, I'm just making a hypothetical. No, hypothetical. Is, just to make it very realistic, nothing is affected. I mean, nobody is affected with my decision. The only thing is that I don't want to follow someone's decision. I want to take my own. Yes. So how do we convince our family or maybe sometimes we have to blindly follow what and everybody is supportive about me doing a job or maybe, you know, starting something of my own. But sometimes what happens is that, like in my case, uh, my husband has like, you know, uh, shortlisted that, you know, maybe you do whatever you want to do, but at the same time, you know, you, you must do this too. Uh, you know, you, I mean, uh, these are the areas which are more good or more uh, opportunities are there. So probably we should explore that when, when we want to get started something of our own. So then, I mean, uh, definitely those areas are good, but then I somewhere feel that, I mean, it's not that completely that like what I have decided or maybe what I want to do. Yeah. So it's like I'm, I'm not following myself. Yeah. That's wherein I get stuck and then 10 different other things are going on in my mind that I should be doing this, that, but not this. So I'm not actually able to focus on the things what my husband is asking me to do. This is what the is the whole okay, picture. Okay, I'll, we'll we'll get to that point in a minute. You were saying something. No, I was just saying that she wants to do something of her own, but someone else has told her that these are more. You should do so this. I mean, even better. my husband says that we should do something of our own, but the ideas are his. Mm -hmm. I get it. I get it's, it's not mine. <laughs> okay. It's not mine. Kind of coming back to my question, I think similar to what you said. Like she knows what she has to do. Oh, I just... Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> But it's just, you know, taking that leap of faith and just following what you know you're supposed to do, but you can't do it. Like, so, you don't know how to do it. Yeah. So, yeah. So, you know, it, the, the timeline is decided by your own procrastination limits that you set for yourself, <laughs> right? Because you know, I, 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 I didn't mean to. Be, I didn't mean it to be funny. I mean, I'm, I really went that. That's what. That's why we don't make decisions. No? We procrastinate. This year we will not do. Next year we will not do. Next year we will do. This year we will do. Right? So you know, those are the things that. Yes, um, <laughs> huh, But you know, the, the procrastinate because you are afraid to face the consequences. Exactly. That. Exactly. That take that 11 second thing and just do it. Shadi karlo. No, no, no. I'm just. So I'll tell you. You know. Uh, uh, I'll tell you my daughter's example. I told you a little bit about my daughter and how she has really influenced the way I think. So uh, she's turning 30 in November. And um, she, um, only child, completely pampered. Uh, but you know, good kid. Anisha is her name. And she, uh, she went to, when she was 16 or 17, she finished high school and she went to college in the US only. She was born, and born there. And so she, um, she went to this liberal arts school, liberal arts college, which is called Bryn Mawr College, B-R-Y-N-M-A-W-R. It's a very famous college in Philadelphia. There are only 400 students in the entire college. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it, it was established in 1850, uh, along with Harvard, by a woman who did not get admission into Harvard, so she started her own college in, 19, in 1850, and so it's all women's college. It's a very, very uh, liberal arts. There are seven colleges now like that in the United States. You must have heard one college called Wellesley College, where you know, Hillary Clinton made famous. But Bryn Mawr is another one which is like that. It looks like that, um, you know, the Lord of the Rings cover, the, all the, it, it's a historic architecture. It's really beautiful. There's a movie called New York with Nitin, Neil Nitin Mukesh. It was shot in that college. Um, so anyway. So she went to that college, all girls college, and she used to play the drums in school, uh, the drum, like in the jazz band. And the entire college had no drum kit. 
right? So there are no drums in the drum kit, and so she's done ballet also all her life, right? So um, she and so she's she's very good at ballet, and she's performed in on stage and all, not, not professionally, but you know as as a college student or something, she did really well in ballet. So she but she wanted to do music, she wanted to do drumming, and. Uh, um, but suddenly, at 50 years of age, her drum teacher suddenly died of a heart attack. This was in 19, uh, 2000, 2002, 2003, something, something like that. After that, she's not touched the drum kit. She has not touched the drum kit after her teacher has died. Then she went to ballet, right? And I have a PhD in immunology. My wife has an engineering degree. She has a master's in engineering. Like we are our typical Indian hardcore engineering mathematics, neto nothing else kind of parents, right? Like, you know, either doctor bano ya engineer bano ya, you know, that, that is the kind of uh, environment that we've been brought up in, and so we also sort of influence in that. So she's hypothetically involved in that process. So she also did her biology. So one thing good in the, in, uh, which is, I, th I see a lot of that happening in India also now, but what is very typical over there is you don't have to choose a subject. You can do whatever with whatever. There's no commerce, there's no arts. There you, so she did, ba she majored in ballet and biology together, right? After that, she worked, she got a job in University of Pennsylvania uh, to work on, a, on cancer cell therapy. It's a very specific kind of cancer cell therapy which started research in University of Pennsylvania. Today, that therapy is, is revolutionizing how cancer patients are treated, right? It cures cancer, this therapy, right? I'll talk about, if you're interested, I'll talk about that. She worked in that lab. Right, as a bachelor student, her rationale was, "I'll go to the, I'll go there, because if I, if I like the lab work, then I'll do my PhD, because there you have to do your PhD, or, or even MBBS you have to do after your bachelor's, or if I, if I like my interaction with patients, I'll go and do work with my patients. I mean, I'll go and do my medicine, right? Five years she worked there. This is the cutting edge lab which is discovering cures for cancer, right? And after five years." Two, three years before that, she had already started learning yoga. Because she was, she was a ballet dancer, she was very good at yoga, very good at yoga, very easy for her to do, right? Today, five years later, full-time yoga teacher. That's all she does, full-time. She's not doing medicine, not PhD, full-time yoga teacher. And very successful. People call her left, right, and center all the time. Very good. Took courage to do that, no? Just did it. In between, she came out. She had to break the news to her mother and me, and you know, tell tell her tell us that she's gay. I had guessed because I used to visit her all the time in college, and I knew her. I knew her behavior from there. Right? But my wife could not tolerate it. Even to this day, she's not accepted it. Five years later. Lynn and Anisha are a fantastic couple, fantastic couple. I have met so many people of different sexual backgrounds that I don't even imagine. There's LGBTQ, N, Q, N plus one, all of these are different kinds of genres of sexual um, families. So they are queer, they're not lesbian, they're queer. Because they have female genitalia, but they, so they are, they, are, they, are not, they are not hormonally, very difficult to talk about this subject, no? So see how easily I'm talking about it, right? Because five years I've interacted with them. Very easy for me to talk about sexual interactions and, and, and Lynn tells me so many things. She says, you know, I, when she was 11 years old, she didn't think she was a woman. She comes, she has come three times to India. Both of them have come three times to India, and they go through the airport, and Lynn walks to the, she, she dresses up like a man, full um, jeans and t-shirt, and you know, her breasts are completely breasts, you know, the tight thing, so you can't tell, like she has breasts, right? And she'll walk on the men's side, right? And she'll, I mean, I mean, the women's side to get security. And when the, when, when the security lady will up, then she'll show her breasts. You know, what, for me, it's like amazing learning, right? of how to, how to deal with human beings. So every hijra that passes through the, the that my, I go in the, in the traffic jam, I always pay that person. Always, because their life is very difficult. So I've talked about sexuality in different forums. 
right? But the reason I was telling you this story is I can't imagine the courage that she needed to do what she did. Relative to that, I'm not going to say it's trivial, what your, whatever decision yours was trivial, but people take incredible decisions. Study people who have taken decisions which are very difficult. Then your decision becomes very easy. And that's all I can say. Right? Sometimes what I feel is that when you are convinced for 60 to 70% about what you want to decide or what you want to do, but then there are factors around you which sometimes either look down upon what you're thinking. Like for example, oh, you're an engineer, oh, you work with Deloitte, and now what you're going to go and teach in a preschool and see what's wrong with you. So sometimes it gets clouded in your head, and then your conviction starts, you know, yeah, yeah. So it, it requires tremendous amount of self-belief for you to just take that leap of faith. Yeah. Is what I... Yeah, and, and there's nothing to lose, really, you know, in that self-belief. You said, one of you said self, right, in that thing. It is, we take it so lightly, you know, about thinking about ourselves. We don't, we really don't... We, we, it, it's nice to, it's a, it's a feel-good feeling to say, I really think about myself. But when you actually deeply think in the, in your, when you're sitting on the toilet seat in the night, right, and you think about yourself, you really are telling the truth to yourself. And it's very hard to tell the truth to yourself. And, and I feel like that's one thing that I've done that has helped me in my own decision-making process. Of course, I'm a little bit more liberated than you are because I don't have to worry about money, which is a big deal. You know, if you don't have to worry about the, like I don't have to work for money anymore, which is, I, I totally understand that that is not a situation that many people have the liberty of being in. But for me, even though I have a lot of money, even then, I think, I have 10 crore, but if my job is going to be done, how will I stay? I will be a big one. That thought still is in my mind. It's unbelievable how the mind works. Right? So, um, I have no answer to this. It's mind games. Your mind constantly plays games with you, and the, the ability, you know, that, that's why this, um, I, I kind of say it philosophically, um, but this uh, pursuit of happiness is, is really the ultimate goal of life. It, I know it seems really uh, ironic that I'm saying it after I'm going to, actually in January I retire. Uh, I turn 58, so I retire. Um, so, but it, you know, it's ironic that I have to say it now. I wish, and my daughter is pursuing happiness today. So they wanted to buy a farm in New Jersey to start organic farming because Lynn is an environmental engineer. So we bought a nine-acre farm in New Jersey. Like half my savings is gone, <laughs> right? But you know, bank me rakhe kya karun? Kuch ho gaya to I'll go and save my daughter only, no? And my sister is here. What am I worried about? So. I'm, I'm speaking about myself, but uh, you know, but, I, but the analogy is this courage, the liberty to sort of let go. Because you know, what is most of you, I am sure, the worst thing that will happen to you is a fantastic life. That is the worst thing that can happen to you today. You don't get a job for the next 10 years, 20 years, you will still live a beautiful life. You have kids, you'll have parties, you'll have every, not, you will not compromise on anything. Right? That is what you have to lose. <laughs> like, gir gir ke kahan girogi? Yahan par girogi. To the best life that people would dream of. I like to tell the story because one of my mentor is a guy called Jim Wilson. Uh, he was the chairman of my department when I was teaching in the University of Pennsylvania. You can look him up on Google. <clears throat> uh, he's MD, PhD. Yeah, at that time. Uh, he's still there. Uh, now he's a very good friend of mine. Um, he was 40 years old at that time, when, in, in, in 2000 or so. Uh, he was the head of the gene therapy unit in, in uh, University of Pennsylvania. He had come from a lab uh, in University of Michigan, which had just discovered the cystic fibrosis gene. Cystic fibrosis is a disease that is caused because it is a, there's a mutation in the uh, lung of little boys, and because of that, mucus accumulates, and the kid dies of, drowns in the mucus. 
That's, how, that's what cystic fibrosis is. The, the theory is that if you provide the normal gene for cystic fibrosis in this, in this patient, the patient will be cured of gene therapy, with gene therapy. This is in 2000, 20, almost 20 years ago. Right? And Jim Wilson had discovered this, the cystic fibrosis gene. University of Pennsylvania had given him a massive space and mandate to develop a gene therapy program in, in, in Philadelphia. He was in a meteoric rise in terms of gene therapy. He would have got the Nobel Prize for gene therapy. What happened? When they started treating the patient with this gene therapy, right? one 16-year-old one boy died of the therapy. Unknown. That happens in, in drug development, right? Patients die when you, when you test drugs in people. Now, when Jim Wilson died, when this patient died under the watch of Jim Wilson, and I was in that department, FDA came down very hard on him. They wanted to set an example that if you do clinical trials in an academic environment, you follow the same rules as everybody else. You don't get lenient, lenient um, regulation because you're an academic institution, right? So what if you don't have the money? Like uh, big pharmaceutical companies have a lot of infrastructure to ensure compliance and safety and this and they'll do, they'll do 10,000 patients, not five patients. They'll do all of that, right? It costs money to do these big trials, right? Jim Wilson said, no, I'm gonna treat these five patients and if, I, if, if it works, you're gonna give me approval. He was telling the FDA. Like that. And FDA said, okay, you tell me. Patient died, they shut him down. He's banned from doing clinical trials for the rest of his life. Right? A man who is about to get the Nobel Prize in 2000, not getting, uh, an, you know, uh, uh, shut down from doing clinical trials. This is life. This is, that's what he's done all his life. He didn't, he didn't give up. He didn't give up. The way you transfer genes into patients, and I can speak about this, uh, this, is, uh, this is what I do for a day job. You, you, you take a gene, you put it into a virus, right? And you infect the virus, let the virus infect the lung, and that's how the gene goes into the lung. That's, how you, that's what gene therapy is, right? You use the ability of the virus to infect the cell to take the normal gene into the lung. That is the mechanism of gene therapy. In 2000, there were overall two viruses that you could work on to, to transfer genes from, uh, to put into a virus and put it in, there was one called lentiviral, well, sorry, uh, retrovirus, which is a different kind of virus, and one called adenovirus, which is a common cold virus. We get cold with that, adenovirus, right? And what Jim Wilson has done, he had modified the adenovirus and put the cystic fibrosis gene into this adenovirus and infect the patient with this adenovirus so that adenovirus, when it infects the patient, um, the patient will become normal because they are expressing a normal cystic fibrosis gene, right? But something happened, the patient died. What happened was my role because the patient actually died of an inflammatory response. That, I'm an immunologist, so that was I studied, right? But after he was banned from doing clinical trials, in the next five years, 10 years, he has discovered 150 different new viruses to transfer genes. 150 new viruses he's found. <coughs> From all animal spectra. Amazing. Somebody would have committed suicide if he had done the clinical trial. After that, he rose. Actually, his shining moment has come now because that's what he's known for for changing the field of gene therapy. But it took that inflection point of the patient dying for him to make that happen. Enormous courage, enormous courage to proceed. But those are the kind of examples, mentors, examples that are really critical in, in getting things done. Is my time up? Yes, it's okay. Okay, I, I, I want to do a very interesting exercise that I've been experimenting on. Can I experiment that on you? <laughs> hmm? Okay. So uh, this part of the talk was what? What was it about? It was inflection points and decision making. Decision making, right? We, we covered. You you have your notes, right? And you send me an email about anything. I have actually got slide decks on all of these. I, I hate to present slide decks because that would you would have fallen asleep by now. Okay. We're going to do something on public speaking. It'll take ten minutes. Yeah. Okay. 
And I have sort of experimented this about public speaking because I feel like communication, all of you, by the way, are speaking really well. I'm really happy to hear the questions that you're asking. OK. Uh, what's your name? Lovelina. Lovelina. Yes. Lovelina, can you please, uh, we don't have time, but can you just say one sentence, like a little bit of a long sentence, three, three, five words each, three sentences. Can be any random thing. Any random? <laughs> yeah, yeah, or whatever. Okay. Uh, I would talk about uh, jobs for her. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I am Lavlina and I have attended this uh, job so fair, uh, this fair affair, affair. And I think it's really helpful because a lot of women who want to get back to the work after a long break. Yeah, uh, time it, time it. Uh, make only three sentences. Three sentences, okay. And, and make it generic. Don't, don't, because everybody is going to say the same words that you say. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I, uh, jobs for fair is really helpful. Okay. 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 Uh, it's providing opportunities for women to grow. By yeah, by providing opportunities. I'm just going to stop there. Okay. okay. Opportunities. You understand what this is? Now, give me another sentence. I need three sentences. Jobs. Jo what is it? Jo uh, jobs for her. Yes. Jobs for her is very helpful by providing opportunities for women. Let's say. Okay. Give me a sentence which ends in a question. What's your name? His name is Ria. Ria. Give me a question. Give me in, along the same lines, or maybe independent. Give me a sentence which ends in a question. Are we all satisfied by the, spending our day with our Okay. Are we all satisfied by our experiences today? Okay. And then third. Uh, you're new, you just joined, right? Yes. Uh, can you, what's your name? Medha. Medha. Medha, can you make a third sentence with an exclamation point? Wow, it was so nice. Little longer, little longer. Wow, it was such a uh, wonderful experience to be here. It was, was nice. Such a wonderful uh, time. Wonder, sorry about the wonderful. We already use experience. Wow, it was such a wonderful day. Day, day. Okay, okay. All right. Uh, what's your name? Ruchi. Ruchi. Can you say? Can you say these three? Read these three sentences for me. Yeah, jobs for her is a very helpful by providing opportunities for women. Are we all satisfied? By experiences, by today? experiences today. Wow, it was such a wonderful time today. Okay, good. Uh, you want to read that? Yes. Sir. Uh, jobs for her is very helpful by providing opportunities for women. Are we all satisfied by experiences today? Wow, it was such a wonderful day. Okay, thank you. Can you now read it, all the three sentences, in two different volumes? Read the whole thing, uh -huh. and then second time you different volume. Okay. Job for her is very helpful by providing opportunity towards uh, women. Are we all satisfied by experiencing today? Wow, how it was such a wonderful day. Second one. No. Job for her is very helpful by providing uh, opportunity for women. Are we all satisfied by experiences today? By today's experience? Wow. It was such a wonderful day. Thank you so much. That was clearly two different volumes, right? OK. What's your name, sorry? Sejal. Sejal. Can you say the same three sentences? Bear with me, by the way. This is going to come to a proper end. Uh, can you say the same three sentences? Same volume, different pitch. Same volume. Different pitch. You say the whole thing once, and then the second time you say it in a different pitch. What is pitch? Pitch means on a higher. Uh... Uh, higher, higher, high, high or low? Uh, high, high or low? What? The tone. No, no, not tone. Pitch, not tone. Tone is different. Pitch. What is pitch? What is pitch? So, yeah. Huh? How? So, can you try two different pitches? Job for her is very helpful by providing opportunities for women. Are we all satisfied by the experience today? Wow, it was such a wonderful day. One pitch. Now, next pitch. 
is a very helpful is very helpful by providing opportunities for women are we all satisfied by experience today wow it was such a wonderful day mm. was it different pitch or different tone so different tone not different pitch what is tone tone is expression when you put expression sad happy delightful you know disgusting those are tones right okay sing with me sa sa job for her is very helpful by providing opportunities today job for her is very helpful by providing opportunities for women to sa re ga ma pa sa re ga ma pa jobs for her is very helpful for providing me opportunities today <laughs> same volume different pitch <laughs> right same tone same everything is pitch is different only the now what's your name mahesh mahesh oh nice names you've got uh, same volume same what do we say same pitch you already did tone tone is sad same tone different pace just say the first sentence you don't have to say all three same volume same pitch same tone different pace pace you know understand pace speed yes and so slow <laughs> yes. Now, different timber. What is timber? I don't know. What is timber of voice? You know, uh, I'll, if I tell you, you'll know exactly what it is. R. D. Burman has a particular timber. What is R. D. Burman? How would R. D. Burman read it? First sentence. You know R. D. Burman. You don't know. Okay, okay. Uh, anyone know how how R D Burman would read it? He would cry. I will. I'll, should I read it? Yes. Yeah. Jobs for her is a very helpful by providing her opportunities today. That is different timber, right? I can go on. I can do many. I can do prasadi. I can do rhythm. I can do pace. I can do so many different things. Just just reading the same thing again, right? but awareness that this is what modulates the voice is so important right i can speak very loudly and i can make sure that you listen to me whatever you want me to it's like theater right i can tell you whatever i want you to tell you but you will never do it right when i was a little boy oh. i had to really work hard on making my voice modulated I learned so many orthogonal things because of the things I do. Because, now huh? But now it comes naturally. That it comes naturally. It public speaking is after all only pa- practice, right? You practice and you become public. And it is not about public speaking. It is just regular communication. Regular communication also needs that voice modulation to be able to influence people. You should be able to speak very clearly, right? Hmm? Very clearly, clearly, right? all of these factors are so important in public speaking go to public speaking classes do exercise on one side and go to public speaking classes you'll get a new job <laughs> <laughs> do you agree i mean i think it is absolutely true right you communicate well and very clearly confidently and your life will change you all know that i don't have to tell you that the process that i have sort of ex- that's why i said i'm experimenting with all of you these are the things that i do and i try to experiment my job in r&d in in biocon is almost 90% motivating the staff that is what i do that i think for me that is the culture of the organization is absolutely critical at biocon we are the largest biotechnology companies in the last 3 years i am very proud to say i have contributed directly to the approval of at least 3 drugs that are made in bangalore and sold in the united states first time ever in india a drug biologic drug made in india is being sold in the us it's so insulin we made it here and sell it in the us it's first time ever it takes a lot of effort a lot of technical know how to get that done regulatory interactions 
So all my experience in the US have, have been helpful. I'm not saying, again, I told you before about my egotistic nature, right? I mean, I, I, with all this thing in my head, my head is always inflated. It, it will be with all the experiences that I have. It won't be human if I say I'm not egoistic. Right? But I'm trying to curtail that egotism. But I'm trying to, what I do is I try to help in developing these processes, in helping how can I disseminate my experiences in a systematic manner so that you can all learn from the things that I have learned. And there are many more. There are 20 other things that I do. 20. I've got a list of everything that I do. There's so many other things. I, I do one session on what is called orthogonal learning. Hmm? Uh, so, like uh, you were, uh, so one of the things we talked earlier is when we go from data to wisdom, there is a process of information comes in between. You, data becomes information, and information becomes wisdom. Different kinds of information becomes wisdom. Right? That's, so the ability of your brain to take different pieces of information and make it into wisdom is a process in your head. That that's what I talked about earlier. And then you, if you reflect on that. I can go on forever if you guys. One more thing can I do, or you've got, got to go? To, to reflect upon this orthogonal thing. So how many of you know quantum physics? No. Heard the, you heard the word. <laughs> what have you heard about quantum physics? What is this so quantum physics? Such an important thing. So you, you've heard about it. No? You don't know exactly what it means. You know what is classical physics? School the kya hoga kuch. Every reaction has an equal and opposite reaction. With Newton's law, you know, right? Deals more with matter. Deals more with matter, right? Yeah. Physical matter. This is more beyond the matter. Yeah, beyond the matter. So these are all these are all abstract things that even I don't know anything about quantum physics. I'm I'm, tr I'm not trying to say that I know much about quantum physics, but for the last three years, I I'll do something. I play the flute. I've been learning to play the flute the last three years. So uh, I take lessons on Skype uh, from a student of mine who, a uh, student, <laughs> teacher of mine who's 25 years old, and he's Hari Prasad Chaurasia's student. So when Hari Prasad Chaurasia Kun was not available to teach, he said, Mera ek student hai, Sangli mein, wo aapko. So he teaches me. Uh, he's 25. So. Thank you. <laughs> so the reason I played this flute is for multiple reasons. That you can actually do whatever you want. There's only your mind blocking you from doing it. Right? So when we go through Sa Re Ga Ma Pa, so everyone's heard this, right? So I'll just go, I'll just show Sa Re Ga Ma Pa, right? Sa Re Ga Ma Pa are called Swar. Swar kya thing is called, right? Shruti naam suna apne? Shruti karke, not, not the girl's name, but Shruti is a concept. Right? What is Shruti? Re ke beech mein re komal hai, go komal hai, ma shud hai. Right? In Sarigama Pa, the sa and pa are fixed frequencies. They are 100, 200, 300, 400, and 500 frequency. This is the hertz, right, of the frequency. Re is 150, ga is 250, and this is 450. They're in the middle. Okay? Those are the Shruti. Actually, Sa or Re ke beech mein, there are infinite number of Shrutis. I'll tell you what that means. From Sa is 100, Sa, Re is Re, right? That is Sa, Re. Sa, Re. I'm actually gliding from Meend, pata hai na? You've, you've heard the word Meend in Hindustani music. You go, you glide from Sa to Re. You don't go Sa, Re. I'm going sa-re. 
and those frequencies in between, which are 101, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 to 200, are infinite. There could be 100.01, 100.0001, infinite number of frequencies, right? You have to go. Because I can't okay, so okay, so what I learned from from classical music, from learning this flute and and the sarigamapa, the, for the first time in three years, I've learned sarigamapa and nisa, and and this abstract thing I know about quantum physics, is that the swar is exactly hundred. So if I play the flute on sa, it is sa. There no there no ambiguity. There no it is not re, it is not ga, it is not ma, it is, it is sa, right? But from sa to go to re. I have to glide. And there are infinite possibilities of where that ray can be. Okay? Those possibilities are only possibilities and they are shrutis. When I stop at a shruti, it becomes a swar. Do you understand what I mean? So I'm going from sa to ray, right? Sa is a swar and ray is a swar. But if I stop in between, then that Shruti becomes a Swar. So what is the relationship of quantum physics? Quantum physics is what is called zero and one in computer science, right? Uh, you either, either you have the green shirt or it's not a green shirt, right? There's no, in, in, and th at this point there's no intermediate. But what quantum physics allows you to do is it allows you to create the possibility. So what practically, uh, and I, uh, this is what I absolutely don't know, but I, I can imagine that this is happening. So I have a keyboard. I type on the keyboard, right? If I type an A, I get an A. I type a B, I get a B. Okay? In quantum computing, what is going to happen, right? Because quantum computing deals with the possibilities. So when my hand, finger, is going towards the A, there is a probability that my finger will touch the A, right? Based on the probability, it will decide whether it is an A or not. So quantum computing in the future will be a keyboard is kept there, you're typing. Like this. That's the probability. The probability that you would, that will be a key, that your finger is moving like this, therefore it might be something like that. That computational energy is quantum computing. So I understood quantum physics by learning Sarigama Padanisa. I would have never imagined. That's what I mean by knowledge becoming wisdom. So thank you so much for your attention. I think you've been a wonderful audience and asking a lot of different questions. Makes me think a lot.